God of Jacob. He's saying that to a person that was not living during the time of either three patriarchs. Moses wasn't around to see and talk to Jacob, Isaac. He didn't even know Joseph. But God is in, in revealing himself in something that's tied to human history. How God is present to him in the present, in that moment of that burning bush, that being consumed by fire. God also said to Moses in that burning bush, I am the God of your fathers. In other words, the voice that was coming from that burning bush was not a voice that just existed in that moment of time, of human time. But a moment that was present in times past with Abraham, when God called Abraham out of Mesopotamia. With Isaac, the promised one. And with Jacob. With these patriarchs, God was present in their moment in time. And God introduces himself in something that's connected to remembering. If I was faithful to these great patriarchs, then Moses, in the plight of your time and situation that we're in, and what I've called, what I'm going to call for you to do, I am going to be faithful and present to you. But God uses memory and the importance of remembering to prove this point of faithfulness to someone who's been shepherding his father's law sheep for some 40 years who's been 40 years removed from Egypt before God calls him to do that. I want to look at two tangible signs in the Scripture. And if you have your Bibles, things that physically God did for his people as a sign of remembering. The, the Lord's Supper is not the first time God did this. It is important and tied to the New Covenant, but notice in 1 Samuel chapter 7. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, we're told at the very beginning that the Ark of the Covenant was left at kirjath Jerem, And it would be there for 20 years. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. Samuel calls the people to, we, we, we need to get away of idolatry in the bells, and we need to come to God, and, and, and they listened, and they fasted, and they mourned at a place called Mespah. And the enemy heard about everyone being gathered at Mespah. And the enemy at the time was the Philistines. And so when they heard that all the people were gathering together and, and they, you know, hearing these things that was taking place, they decided to bring their great army upon this place at Mespah. And guess what happens? Because of the genuineness and the faithfulness of God's people repenting, rededicating, returning back to God. Notice what God does for them. Beginning in verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 7. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with the loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and it confused them that they were overcome by the Israelites. They were successful. They were successful not because of themselves. They were successful because of God. And guess what Samuel does? As they were successful with that, in verse 12, then Samuel took a stone... He set it between Mespah and Sheen, and he called it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. You may have in your Bible, as my Bible has a footnote, Ebenezer means rock or stone of help. Now, the stone itself was not their salvation. The stone itself was not their saving grace. The stone was not to become a, an idol, a, a, a new bell, if you will, for the people to worship because the, the stone 
caused the great thunder to confuse the Philistines and, and, and make them... No, the stone was a reminder of this event, that God has helped us this far. That people that were not experiencing this situation, that were not involved in the circumstance, that generations before after them, that when they see this stone and what it represented, they're reminded that God has helped us. He hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't tossed us to the side, if you will. It was a visible symbol for the people. They could look at it. They could touch it. They could, they could visualize it because it's right there. But it was connect them to a memory. The memory was simply this. Remember that God saved us. God was gracious to us. He, he, he forgave us. He accepted the sacrifice that was offered. And respond in a very thunderous way. You see, remembering what God has done helps us today. It helped the people then as they thought about the rock or stone of help of their day. And, it, and they would reach the conclusion, if, if God has helped us this far, if, if God is, is this stone reminds us and helps us to remember, if God has been with us in times past, then why would he forsake us in our presence? Why would he abandon us in our future? The greatest tangible sign in the Old Testament is the Passover. In Exodus chapter 13, again in Exodus chapter 13, verses 5 through 9, it reads, And that shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, God keeps his promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be among you in, in all your quarters." And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt, from those that didn't live Egypt, from those that didn't look like Egyptians, from those that didn't smell like Egyptians, for those that were so far removed from Egyptian lifestyle and what it was like to be a slave under Egyptian. You need to tell them, This is what the Lord has done for us. This is why we partake of this. This is why we do this. Notice what he says in verse 9. It shall be a sign to you on your hand as a memorial. As a memorial. Between your eyes before the Lord's law and be in your mouth. For the strong hand of the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. as they were to eat of the unleavened bread, as they were also to eat of the bitter herbs, as they had observed this moving forward once a year, the nation relived, reenacted, if you will, the Passover, that tenth and final plague that God administered upon Egypt. It was their saving grace, salvation from death, that they eat of this unleavened bread and that they eat of the bitter herbs. Because that was what was done and eaten and consumed the very first Passover. Moving forward in the wilderness and moving forward once they had conquered Canaan. The fathers are to tell your children, why are we doing this, Dad? Why are we eating the bitter herbs? Why are we eating unleavened bread? You're doing this because what the Lord did for us coming out of Egypt. You see, the biblical example of remembering is calling to mind God saved us again. God was gracious to us again. It's to bring 
what had happened in the past and by remembering it, bringing it into our present. Again, if God has saved us, if God has gone to such great measures and lengths to do what he has done for us, here we are in our present, then why shouldn't we have hope as we look towards the future? Why were the Israelites, why were they in the promised land to eat of the unleavened bread? Why in the promised land, when they finally got to the land of milk and honey, why were they to continue to eat of the bitter herbs and of the sacrificed lamb? Because what God did for them in Egypt. Yes, this, they were removed from this. Yes, you're talking about generations when it now comes to the divided kingdom, when it comes to that part of history during the Mosaical Age, when there was no one who was there when Egypt, in Egypt. But they know the story. They heard about the story. They, they, they remember, they were growing up, they, they partake of the certain time of the year, this Passover meal, and thinking about what God has done for them. Egypt was far gone and removed that time, but yet it was to be brought up in their present because what God did for them. As we think about remembrance in the New Testament, as Jeff read, if you look at verse 23, what Paul said, what I delivered to you is what I have received from the Lord. If Paul ever says that, that this is from the Lord, this is re receiving from the Lord, then this is not Paul's suggestion. This is not Paul's just on his own sound advice. That he's giving a command from God. This comes from God. This comes from Jesus. This comes from the Lord. And in that, he reminds them of what is the institution, the two tangible signs of what is known as the Lord's Supper, which has come a central part in the Christian age. Russ reminds us in Acts 20, the church, the early church, met on the first day of the week to partake and break of bread. Both emblems, the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup, point to specifically who? Jesus. We eat it and drink it. Not to say, hmm, this is stale, or boy, this sure tastes bitter. This may taste sweet. I'm hungry. What's for lunch? No, to remember Him. Remember me. Now, I, I stand before you to say that's not as easy as, as, as it is to say that. There may be some first day of the weeks that's much easier for us than other first day of the weeks. There may be some times in our life that remembering Him is coming a little bit easier because less distractions in our life and in our world. Then there are other times, and it's not so much. You see, folks, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's not just about the past. It's not just about what we're doing in the present. It's a continuous thing with God when it comes to tangible memorials. It's to remember what I've done for you, how I have saved you, how I've been gracious to you, and the hope we have going forward. Tomorrow, Lord willing, is Memorial Day, and we remember the, the greatest sacrifice that's given. Jesus says, no greater sacrifice than this, than the one to lay down his life for his friends. What about one laying down his life for the people he doesn't even know? People he won't even know going forward. Our country, aside from religion, 
sees the importance of remembering in remembrance of the past to remember in the present to help us look forward and be better in the future. In other words, don't get complacent and don't take for granted the freedom that you have. Folks, that ties hand in hand with Christianity. Every first day of the week, we engage in something that we've done if we grew up in the church or if we converted, we see happening. It's, if you're a visitor, it's probably the most... It's the, it's the most act that we do that really stands out because it involves eating and drinking. But it's so important that we remember what Jesus, what we have heard and what we've been faithfully told, what He's done to help us in our present to look forward in the future. The Lord's Supper reminds us, is a tangible reminder that God keeps His promise. Finally, as we think about in closing, the greatest memorial that we are able to be take part of is something that involves us. We need to think of it in that personal way. He died for me. He died for me. You hear accounts of soldiers and the mental anguish of people in their unit going into harm's way and some of them that they were close to not walking out. And having to relive that over and over. Horrible. Horrible. And yet, moving in a, in a small way of knowing that that person that's involved in that, that someone that they love that was with them, that helped them, that died, something they can't forget or won't be able to forget. The same should be the said for us when we think about it personally with Jesus. The physical acts of partaking and participating in it is to help us. It's to keep outside outside and keep what is in that needs to be in. And we do this and continue to do this faithfully in remembrance. Of him. The greatest of all the memorials that we have, it is the greatest because it involves Jesus. The greatest person, being who's ever lived. The greatest life that's ever been lived. Bart has selected the appropriate song we're going to stand and sing, and if we can help assist you, the imitation of our Lord is offered to us to think in your past how God has done, what God has done for you, the grace He has allowed for us to have today, to respond to Him in the way that putting Him on in baptism, confessing, repentance, or rededicating our lives, and if God has helped us this far, He's not going to let us go or drop us. He's going to continue to be faithful in our lives moving forward. Now, we close again that song, I, I, I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know who holds the tomorrow. And if we're in Him, we're in the best place that we could ever be. We can help you with that, whether you're online or in person. Invitation is offered as together we all stand and sing.
Father, thank you for this most beautiful day that you've made, that we could truly rejoice and be glad in it. We love you so much and we cherish you and we thank you for everything that you've done for each and every one of ourselves. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. And we know what tomorrow means. Everyone in America knows what tomorrow means and the significance of it. And as Josh said this afternoon, the greatest memorial is Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and everything that he's done for us. And we love you for that. And we love you, Jesus, for that. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you that you provide for us and you meet our needs every day. Next month, men will be remembering a day that they call Father's Day. It's on the calendar. But you are the father of all fathers. You're the greatest father of them all. And we should celebrate you every day. We love you. And we appreciate you. And we need you. You know our every need. And you know that there are so many people on the sick and prayer list. And you are, know our needs before we even ask for them. And in the Bible it says that we are to pray for one another. So I'm bringing these to your attention, as you already know. Everyone on the sick and prayer list at Charlotte Heights Church of Christ and other churches all over the world. You love us. We are your children. You are our Father and you care for us. And we need you. And we are so thankful that we have you and that we could come to you any time. And we are so thankful that we live in the greatest country in the world that we could come to one of your buildings 
and serve you on Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons, Wednesdays, whenever these doors are open. And we know that you are open to us 24-7. We can come to you at any time and pray to you and seek you. Please help us to be acceptable to you in every day throughout our lives. We live for you. We live, we move, we have our being because of you. You are everything to us. And we know that you are in control. You're in charge. There's a lot of things going on in this world. Please help us to be more loving towards one another. That's what Jesus said that we're supposed to do. Please help us to gather together and unite as Christians, as human beings, and stop the hate. You created every one of us, and it's documented in the great book of Genesis. You created everyone, and we should love each other. And as you created the things that you created, that's documented in the great book of Genesis, when you were finished, you said it was good. And no one should argue. No one should say who's good or who's bad. We should not dislike people. We should love one another as you have loved us. And please help us, please give us the strength to love one another. We are all brothers and sisters and you want us to love one another. Please help us to do whatever we can physically in every aspect to stamp out hatred and bigotry. Please help us to read your words and understand them and do as you are asking us to do. And as it says in the great book of Matthew that Christians are the light of this world. We are the light of this world. And please increase our light that we can go to strangers, those who do not know you, and that we can be examples and that we can speak to them about you and be witnesses. We don't need to put a bushel over our lights and cover ourselves. As we are out and about, let us not talk about sports or politics or news or fake news. Let's talk about the good news, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Please utilize us and please spend us as the Christian currency that we are. We love you and we just thank you for everything you've ever done for us and are doing for us right now. We thank you that you do not give up on us. Human beings will give up on us. Sometimes our family members will give up on us, but you'll never give up on us. You said that you'll never forsake us. You'll never leave us. You are always there for us. And we love you and we thank you. And as always, thank you oh so, so very much for the death, burial, and resurrection of your one and only dear sweet son, Jesus, human time, Lord, and personal Savior. Amen.